Welcome to day three. In day two, you learned all about carbon from Nick and Christina. You know, there's different ways to measure operating carbon, embodied carbon, and we can't improve what we don't measure. Today's lessons are all about BIM, uh, which is an artifact of the process that's being measured by the tools you were shown yesterday. And we're gonna talk about the relationship of BIM to digital twins and how digital twins are gonna be used to improve the sustainability of the whole process that's being measured. In our first bite-sized video today, for those that don't know Marty Rosmanith, who is one of the original creators of Revit and has become one of the foremost experts on digital twins. I like to say the godfather of BIM. <laughs> Thanks. In the second video, I'll be joined by Joel Pennington, who is an expert in VR, AR, and cloud, and he's going to be talking to us about how those technologies are going to be used with digital twins to impact sustainability. Make sure you keep up the comments in the YouTube channel. We'll be responding to those. Enjoy today's education. Okay, in today's video, we're gonna go into BIM and its relationship to sustainability and how the productivity problem uh, in the construction side of things is also causing bad sustainability outcomes. And we're gonna get into the problem statement and what the root causes might be so today, let's get into first a brief history of BIM because it's um, in my it's only two slides, but it's I think essential into understanding some of the first principles that that create the root cause for some of these things, and then we'll get into the relationship to sustainability and some of the gaps. To start with BIM, you first have to start with what came before BIM, which was CAD. Uh, and CAD, as we all know, is a direct analog of drawing on a drafting board. Uh, if you make a line on a drafting board, you make a line in CAD. Um, if you make a circle on a drafting board, you make a circle in CAD. Uh, pretty easy to explain to somebody how you take what they do uh, on a drafting board. It's the exact same process. It's just done using a different tool. So let's contrast that with BIM, which uh, doesn't have the metaphor of a drafting board, but rather has the metaphor of a cardboard model. So I've talked about this before, um, really for the last uh, 10 years, about how it's a cardboard model and um, the benefits of that uh, in that it's kind of easy to, to, to learn um, because it's a straightforward metaphor, but the downsides to that, um, given that it's made for doing permit drawings. Uh, and that's the, the theory of this is that it's a cardboard model, but it's a special kind of cardboard model so that if you pull the edges of a wall, they stay connected. So it's kind of like a rubberized cardboard model um, that's uh, better than a physical cardboard model in that you can alter it and it, it will figure out what to do. And the whole idea behind BIM was then you could um, produce by just cutting it various ways, whether it's plan or section. Um, or projecting it like elevation and cutting it even at higher levels of detail for detail sections and things like that. You could produce a good chunk of the drawings needed for a permit set. And then if you updated the model, uh, it would update all of those drawings. And that really is the primary use case for why BIM was created, was to produce coordinated permit sets for architects and engineers to reduce errors and omissions. Now, lo and behold, everybody said, wow, this is great. Um, can we apply it in construction? And so that created what I call the theory of pre-construction. Um, and that is basically take a BIM tool, take a uh, lighter weight visualization tool like Navisworks, and can you repurpose the data so that um, you know people planning construction could get some benefit out of it? And I would say they have gotten some benefit out of it. But if you look at, uh, for instance, the theory of the pre-construction BIM, uh, you can see the advantages that were supposed to accrue to contractors um, down below. And what I'm going to show to you is that despite BIM being around for 20 years, this first one of reduced rework and material wastage is actually really bad. Uh, it has not improved uh, as much as it really should. And we're going to talk about why. And then the second part is hassle-free on-site fabrication installation. Uh, in fact, the fact that there's rework is driving, um, these two are highly related and we're going to show you with recent data uh, collected about uh, the process from contractors and subcontractors that this isn't the case. Now, why do you care? Well, if you have this kind of waste, it's going to lead to bad 
sustainability scoring because any amount of waste is going to produce carbon. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, why waste is such a big problem in construction um, and for your projects. And you care because the owner cares and the owner doesn't want to pay for this either. So let's get into it. Uh, we'll dive into it. So I'm making a claim. Now I'm going to back up my claim. So first off, this uh, group, uh, FMI, uh, which is a, it's a real estate investment group, did a survey and, um, and analyzed data coming from, as you can see, the audience breakdown on the right, largely you know, 75% almost were general contractors and specialty trade contractors. And you can see what the, um, the ranking is. And there were almost a thousand of these in this. So it's a large sample. Um, you can see that the contractors cite increasing complexity of construction, the accelerated schedules and supply chain issues. And <clears throat> this is why I'm saying that um, there is something that we can do to help improve the process because the process is what produced the waste, the waste that what's produced the bad sustainability outcomes. Because sustainability just measures a process. And if the process isn't good, you're going to get a result that, that, that points to a bad process. This almost 50% in the middle is what I call the how. Um, so if BIM makes the what you're going to build and documents it in drawings, these contractors are essentially saying, okay, that 31% on the left might address the complexity of the what, but I still have 50% of the how I'm going to do it to figure out. So let's dive into this some more and see if we can unpack this to understand how we might improve it. So the other thing after analyzing this was that FMI found out that rework amounts to 19% of the total project costs in the sample of almost a thousand contractors that they had. Uh, and that is not the only waste in the system. So if you've got almost 20% of rework, I make a claim that you still have another 10%. And so for the last 10 years, every time I've been talking to contractors and owners, um, I've made a claim that there's 30% waste built into the type of engineer to order delivery system in construction. And nobody's really disputed that. In fact, it's almost um, commonly understood that that's the level of waste in the current engineer to order construction bidding delivery process. Um, the other thing too, is that if you get a handle on this and there are obviously leaders in the market that are trying to get a handle on this earlier uh, and sooner rather than later, you find that they're actually far more profitable. So if we had 19% waste, and that's an average, so some projects you know, might be 25, some projects might be 17. If we look at carbon scoring, and I'm showing you just a, a, a random true carbon report for a construction project, it measures four things, energy, water, waste, and offsets. And from the data that we've collected, waste is always 10 times greater than all of the other ones. And that results from what the owner perceives as just a lack of planning, which is producing this 19% rework. And what happens here is that that waste results not only in things that should have been installed getting landfilled, but now having to order more material, which is more embodied carbon, to do it again uh, because it wasn't done right the first time. So, uh, you know, if we address this underlying productivity problem and planning problem in the construction process, um, we can really impact the sustainability outcomes because they're directly related to each other, and we believe that strongly. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about kind of the, the big approaches to this, but I don't want to get into the solutions yet. Today, we're just analyzing the problem. And we'll talk about potential technology that can apply to it when we talk to Joel. Um, so the other last thing that I will point out from this FMI study is that when they asked these thousand respondents, what are the, the biggest challenges to executing better planning and pre-construction? They cited these things, collaboration with the stakeholders, leveraging data and the handoff to construction. And again, I this is just another way for me to say they are talking about the how this is going to get done. That's the reason they need a collaboration. That's the reason they're looking for the data. Um, in, in the last few years, 
uh, at least twice a year, I've met with a group of electrical subcontracting companies, some of these national subcontracting companies. And, you know, one of the things I hear all the time is the design is never finished. The design is never finished. And the reason is that they're doing what they call design build in the field. So um, this is just the reality of it. I'm not describing things that people on the construction side of the fence don't already know. But let's get into why BIM hasn't fixed that. So the first piece of this is that the complete bomb doesn't exist, meaning the data isn't there. Bomb is bill of materials. And what I mean by that is not some list of families in Revit, which is, you know, uh, a, a thing that's a placeholder for something that somebody might actually specify purchase and install. Those things are, these things do not have um, SKUs that you can go and order them with. They're just, the, you know, this is a wall mounted drinking fountain. Uh, it's not a particular brand. It's not a particular one that you can order. It's just it's a it's a place where you're supposed to, as a contractor, install a wall mounted drinking fountain. That's great in a simple example like a drinking fountain. But when we get into whole systems like, you know, a complicated commercial electrical system like what I'm showing you here, um, it's a lot of stuff that's not getting modeled at all because a lot of this is sometimes just drawn in 2D AutoCAD and then the contractor that gets selected gets to actually figure this out with um, engineers from the manufacturer's representatives of the equipment they're specifying. Um, the next part is that from the standpoint of actually doing the work required in the computer, because people aren't doing it, we can come to the conclusion that it's just too hard or expensive to model the complete system. And in fact, when we show you, you know, a, a piece of a model from Revit Systems, what you see here is the same sort of thing. You don't see actual equipment and duct work. You see placeholders for it. These are, you know, the way the system might be routed if the contractor chose to use this routing. And then um, in this um, clip from Informed Infrastructure, one of the things they were talking about was the ability from Revit to take out the list of things in the system to take it into other tools like fabrication tools so you it might eventually produce the fabrication model. However, from the standpoint of whether that data is accessible to the team, no, it's not in the BIM file any longer. It's not in your Navisworks file any longer. It's been taken into some specialized system that's living in a silo that, say, the mechanical contractor has, but nobody else is able to see or coordinate against. So it's one of the reasons that we have rework in the field is that um, just the data doesn't exist. And even if the data is created, it's sitting in somebody's separate silo. Uh, the idea of the digital twin is to unify all these things uh, in a cloud-based environment so people are able to do the proper planning and coordination to get rid of this level of rework. Again, we're not going to talk about solutions. We're just analyzing the problem. Next part is that, you know, when you look at, and there are ways to take what's in BIM and start doing work planning. I'm showing you actually a success story from Autodesk's website about how PCL does concrete planning. You can see these are bid packages for concrete and steel. Um, and you can see there's seven bid packages. Now, this is for one particular building, but of course, if they do a different building that has a different configuration on a different site, they're gonna have a different number of bid packages. The process changes because fundamentally what they're trying to do and the how they're trying to do it is gonna fundamentally change because the building's different. That makes it very, very, very difficult to standardize a process and apply it across all the projects. And so, what we get in this industry are what I call systems of record, whereas in other industries that have tackled this problem, they've deployed systems of process. What I'm proposing is that there is a way of improving the delivery of these projects, but that it's not gonna be done using a system of process. Rather, it's going to be done by understanding how to leverage better the data in the systems of records to create a series of multiple models for the different stages of the process. Um, now, so again, why get into this topic at all? It is because the owners, again, see this rework coming, see the amount they have to pay for it. And, and you know, at GBH, we deal with owners that are very interested in the sustainability of their entire building portfolios. In fact, they made public statements about it and government entities are now enforcing those public statements. And so they can't just let what they perceive as a lack of planning 
and waste in the field uh, essentially create a situation where they can't keep their promises around the sustainability of their building portfolio. So the owners themselves are driving this agenda. In the future, we believe at GBH that unless you can prove that you're going to be able to deliver a sustainable project in the future, you aren't going to be able to get a building permit. And that's going to not only impact your owner, but obviously it'll impact you as a designer and as an engineer. So let's look at how owners see this. You know, although almost 80% of the general contractor respondents said they have a formal pre-construction process, that's not what the owners saw. The owners thought basically uh, that half of them had no no process. And it's because they see the waste that's coming from this and the fact that BIM applied pre-construction isn't fixing it. So in the next video, we're going to get together with Joel because there is some really great evidence of using new technologies to actually improve things in the productivity of the subcontractor process using the data that we have today if it's only freely available to the parties that need it at the time they need it. So with that, thanks for watching this video and I uh, hope you're enjoying the education. We'll see you in the next video.